So good morning, Jovita, Jovita, Jovita. It is wonderful to meet you face to face. We've had many a conversation and really have enjoyed getting to know you and some of your work as the U.S. Treasurer at the Treasury Department. And uh, we followed your career after that. And uh, we really appreciate your support and interest in the Treasury Historical Association and the work that we're doing and the work that we're launching for years forward. So we're here today to talk about women in leadership and your story of how you came to be at the U.S. Treasury and um, some of the exciting activities and events and consequences and <laughs> challenges <laughs> that came up while you were there. So why don't we begin by um, just telling us a little bit about how you came to be there? Did you have mentors or um other individuals who helped you see that a role at the Treasury might be interesting for you? Um, let me start by saying that when I was called to consider being the 44th treasurer, United States treasurer, um, I was surprised, I was elated, and considered a real honor just to receive the call, let alone seriously consider coming on board and um, serving this wonderful country. So it, w it started out with a phone call. It was this, this position, this role, this responsibility was never on my radar screen. However, uh, when there was momentum and the process began working itself through, and here I am in front of the Secretary of Treasury, Steve Mnuchin at the time, uh, and it was part of the swearing in, and a statement he made really encapsulated everything that occurred, and, and that was a comment he made that, isn't it a wonderful country? It's really remarkable where a young person like myself at that time learned the value of, of a dollar that now was in a position to actually put my name on it. And then he accentuated that by saying, to be more specific, because this is really my story, um, that one day going from being a cashier at a bank, cashing checks, to now endorsing the United States currency was just um, such a, a wonderful opportunity and something that I can, can't even express without sensing a, a bit of emotion because it was such a, was a huge undertaking as, as it relates to saying yes and signing up for a role at Treasury. Um, the, the other point was, as a former uh, executive in the private sector, I knew the value uh, and the importance of monetary uh, education, monetary understanding and appreciation, and the impact um, that our financial institutions uh, bring not only to our country, but to the world. And so the, the other point I, I wanted to make was that Receiving the call was a distinctive honor, yes, but more importantly, it was really to support the president's agenda that was really focused in on prosperity, a stronger government, and of course, a more responsive uh, government. Well, um, was there any one person who you meant you, that you were in the private sector? Was there any one person or group of people who influenced that career that led you to serving the public? It, it was a, a kind of a, an aspiration that I've had for many, many years to do more than just work in the private sector and, and be an executive and be ex, uh, responsible for many young potential leaders. There was a world outside of the private sector. There was a world outside of the academia that I also considered participating in. Uh, and when the opportunity came to assist 
candidates to elected offices and then the tap to serve, I just thought, how do you refuse or decline an opportunity such as that? And so that would seem, seem like one of, one of the two or three milestones that I had set out and had envisioned for myself and my family. And when the opportunity to avail itself, I just signed up for, for the duty. Super. Now, you were, when you were in the private sector, if I remember correctly, you were at UPS. And that seems like a interesting company to grow to lead. Is that something that you planned, uh, that you aspired to as well? That's a very interesting question because when I signed up to work at United Parcel Service, it was a means to an end. In other words, I started out as a part-time loader and worked my, work, my way up the corporate ladder. Um, when I say means to an end, I was going to school, I was raising my child as a single parent, and it all came together when I realized that UPS had a very good um, and strong uh, wages that I could cancel out perhaps one or two of the other jobs I had and just focus in on UPS. So it was a very substantial experience in my entire career. That is to say, I started as a loader and unloader, but it afforded me so many opportunities to excel. And along the way, I learned about managing teams, about not only managing teams, but also the dynamics of profit and loss the bottom line and the responsibility that we had to customers and our stakeholders. And that training, that cultivation, really enabled me to be better prepared when the call came in, not only for a treasurer, but as deputy administrator a while back in 2006. So yes, the, the calling to serve, I felt I was fully prepared and can and, and would be able to, should I say leverage, everything I learned in the private sector, from an international scope to team building, to profit and loss, and now um, serve the country. What a great experience. That's, that's a real hands-on training. And I have to say, you know, maybe all of us feel like we're a little bit closer to UPS uh, after the last couple of years and depending on them so much. And uh, uh, I have to say, you know, the, the encounters that we've had personally and, and even, you know, through office <clears throat> um, relationships is there are some really terrific people working uh, and that are the face of UPS, driving those trucks and loading and unloading and making sure that the customer gets what they expect. Uh, whatever that culture is, it... Um, I'm sure you helped shape it, and I'm sure that uh, there's some good things going on there that maybe you know we could learn in, from in government. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out because the regimentation, the discipline that that company, um, how they operated and how we learned to operate and, and manage that particular structure really enabled me to appreciate the talent in the federal government payroll, as well as the commitment to the taxpayers. So it aligned really, really well the parallels between the commitments we had in the private sector to its customers to now in the federal government, the commitment we have to our taxpayers. And so I just transitioned very easily from one to another. Uh huh. Well, I can see. I can see. It makes perfect sense to me. So um, when you landed at Treasury, um, what Tell us about your first few days while you were on the job. That was, that's a terrific position. I, the more I learn about the role of the U.S. Treasurer, the better I think. It sounds like just a great job for um, young women and, and people to aspire to. Tell us what was, a, what was your most memorable day and tell us what you did in that role. Well, I would need an entire day to share the, the moments, the special events that occurred on day one, uh, just accessing Treasury and being so impressed by the infrastructure and by the people, when I say infrastructure, including the personnel and all of the leaders 
uh, and treasury and the history of the treasury. So when I walked into the building, I felt so much smaller than when I thought walking up those steps. And I thought, wow, how am I going to impact? What am I going to do first? Where are the manuals? Where's the SOPs, the MOPs? Where are the policies? And what I learned very quickly is that there is such a support system in every one of these agencies and treasury being the pinnacle of the monetary system of the world, as well as leading financial and monetary um, policies for the world. I just knew that I had to jump in and learn and gain quick knowledge in order to be impactful. And so the support systems were all of the um, leaders, especially the secretary staff, that greeted me and asked, what do you need? And I said, give me a couple of days to understand that question and then I will um, uh, embark and, and call you. But what was important in the initial interview I had with the secretary is that he laid out some of the objectives that he had for the, the treasurer's office. One was to elevate the Financial Literacy and Education Commission um, work, body of work and that he thought I could be very instrumental in that area. He, and, and what I meant by ele elevating, he wanted to um, put more structure as well as deliverables, measure the outcomes, the performance of the commission. So I took that to heart, um, that to heart on day one, learned everything I could about that particular commission. And then I learned that I was responsible for Fort Knox as well as four other mints and operations is part of my DNA, and that I would be meeting um, a lot of the frontline employees, the production ent um, indices, learn them very quickly, and work at improving their efficiencies and their morale and opportunities for promotion and things as such. So the mint operations were a very critical component um, of, the, of the, the office of the treasurer. And so I visited that operation much more frequently uh, than I think they appreciated, but I, there was a lot of work to be done. Uh, one of the areas of focus I had as a treasurer uh, with the mints, not only efficiencies and training, employee training, and also making it responsive to the financial institutions that we provide coinage for, the market, the retailers. But it was also, can we improve automation? Can we increase the uh, performance? And how effective are we in providing the goods to our stakeholders? And so that three-pronged approach engaged the entire uh, body of um, Mints, again, Fort Knox and four others, and uh, we made some specific gains. That was a very interesting historical operation to manage. And so it didn't take me long, Julie, to really assess what needed to be done, what were the priorities, and how I was going to implement uh, the change. Did you get involved in the design of any of the currency during your term or, or the, um, the coins? I know that's quite a complicated um, there's a whole um, sort of anti-counterfeiting, anti-money laundering, you know, role that the Treasury plays. Is that something you had a chance to be a part of? That was a, a very unique experience in the sense of security um, and the fraudulent practices in the market having to do with coins. And so that was one piece of it. The other was the design and the legislation of coins. That, Quarter program is an example of, of legislation that has to be vetted through Congress so that a particular design, um, a particular cost for the coin, and, and how it's going to be circulated and when, and what states were going to be engaged. It's, it's a pretty comprehensive process, which I um, learned very quickly. I was very closely engaged because the secretary was... Um, very much engaged in coin design and going, uh, coin programs. 
And so one of the highlights in coin design was when I worked closely with um, a couple of senators that, uh, should I say, um, sponsored and advocated for the women's suffrage centennial coin. And um, that was what a wonderful undertaking within the 90 day period, really get that legislation done. It was quick. Uh, but when there's a need and there's advocacy and there's Senate uh, support as well as Congress, then things move very quickly in, in government. So yes, there were several highlights, a quarter program, there was a women's uh, suffrage centennial coin, and then there were other um, kind of the penny reduction or efficiency modeling, which by the way, I have a, a bracelet made out of pennies. And, and I would wear this to the staff meeting when I would meet with the secretary to remind him I'm working on reducing the cost of the penny production. So there were good times, there were intense moments, there were very um, extensive collaboration, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't replace those experiences um, for anything in the world. It, it was uh, great working with such great teams, uh, treasury teams, to pull it all off. Well, uh, everyone that I've that I've met who works for Treasury is just outstanding. It's, it's in my view one of the um, one of the really most admired agencies or departments in the in the federal government. Uh, the people are just superb, and uh, I agree. It must have been must have been a real great experience to work with them in your role. Yes, Julie. I, I had never met so many attorneys or economists um, and financial PhDs under one roof. I mean, I was engaged with the smartest, the most wise financial subject matter experts in the world. And that was such a unique experience. I use that term very selectively because not everyone has the opportunity to engage with such talent and we have it all kind of encapsulated in, in the Treasury operations. Well, I'm, I, um, I think that is a story that can also be told uh, because the average American wouldn't even think about that. You know, they, they, they might notice somebody's signature on a dollar bill, but do they pay attention? You know, does it change from time to time? <laughs> There's a if you if you go to the bank and you get some cash for whatever purpose you need, you might find four or five different signatures over you know several different dollar bills or or, or um, denominations, and um, who knew who knew that there's this whole machinery behind the scenes that's making this work, and making it work so efficiently. Now now that actually brings me to um, something that we've talked about a bit, which is. Uh, financial literacy, which you've already mentioned, and financial civics, which is sort of a term that we're playing around with to see if it makes sense, particularly on the historic side uh, of the economic structure and our financial systems and the way that works. Um, maybe you could speak to how important that is and and how your financial literacy efforts, who, who they're trying to reach, and how, how can Americans take more advantage of those kinds of opportunities? Julie, the Financial Literacy and Education Commission, which is called FLEC as an acronym, engaged about 20 to 22 agencies, federal agencies, and each agency has programs provides grants to community entities, whether they're non-for-profits, whether they're chartered schools, um, or through symposiums of sort, scholarships, et cetera. But each agency has a, has a particular program portfolio. The, the, the undertaking that I initiated early in 20, late in 2017, but very early and very intensely in 2018, was to reform the body of work that the commission was um, actually in, in 
not only incorporating in their big picture agency responsibilities, but also were tracking their successes. But yet, when you looked at the data of high school dropouts and literacy levels in particular areas, especially the underserved communities, there was, there was a need to, for a call to action. And so in, in the process of reforming, what we did was we established some very significant case studies utilizing, optimizing, leveraging the academia community and sought them out to assist us by assessing our particular um, strategy for financial literacy, when I say R, the commission. And with their input in about six to seven months of intense reviews and research, and also assessing their uh, existing studies, we came up with a report and we housed over 130 subject matter experts in financial literacy in October of 2018. It was the first time in the commission's history that we convened a meeting at the White House with a very diverse group of um, subject matter experts in the financial literacy, anywhere from Price Waterhouse Cooper to IBM to women's colleges, universities to HBCUs, private sector uh, mergers and acquisition associations. We had a plethora of insight and we featured universities that were performing best in practice, that had best in practice and great results. And we elevated the need to, to promote financial literacy in every state. We even engaged lieutenant governors and uh, state treasurers. And each of them um, had gone, returned to their states with some of the best practices that the commission developed. It was a treasurer report. So that was, a, a, from a national uh, scope, we made uh, impact uh, very quickly and structured it where we now had documentation, data to, to uh, implement. And so, yes, you couldn't have a tax, tax Cuts Jobs Act. Enrich your population, support the small businesses, and lack in financial literacy. So you can enrich monetarily many of your citizens, but if managing their finances for emergencies, times of crises like the pandemic that we just experienced, that we're, we're falling short of really closing the gap on developing prosperity and a very healthy economy. When I say prosperity, family prosperity and a healthy economy in the nation. So, so it's, a, it's an all-encompassing process and I'm not done yet. That's why I look forward to helping you out <laughs> at THA. Uh, just as a, on the periphery, providing any guidance and insights that our commission uh, really developed in such a short time. Now tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. We deeply appreciate all that you've done for THA, which has been pretty remarkable. I mean, you really set us down this path of, of exploring how financial literacy, financial civics fits into our mission, which we're a nonprofit. And we certainly don't have the resources that a agency or a department has, but um, as you say, it's composed of some very bright people who have some great insights into way to, ways to get things done. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, but tell us more about some of the other organizations that you're getting involved with and how they are particularly focused on elevating young women, girls, and maybe raising sites of opportunities and possibilities. You know, Julie, I have been invited to participate at several think tanks, I won't name them, but there's about three of them. And the reason they reached out to me was because of my involvement in the financial literacy. So you have think tanks that realize the importance of financial literacy in the underserved community, especially in the women population because they have the toughest experience of access to capital. And so it really discourages them. Uh, they're 
it's, it's a distraction for them to progress in owning a business or owning a home, et cetera. So I was very, I was tracking how many think tanks were very focused on, on financial literacy. And then I said, well, let me go back and re-engage as a trustee at a women's college. What a forum and a platform where I could impact and add value based on the experience I gained at Treasury with the Financial Literacy and Education Commission. In addition to that, I'm also supporting my, I'm assisting my niece who's running for state Congress here in Illinois. And I thought, you need to put this on your agenda as part of your podium speech that financial literacy and access to capital is really, really critical for all communities, but more importantly, uh, a particular demographic. And then, uh, of course, I'm assisting by speaking at women's, uh, at universities, women's business clubs, etc. So we're trying to, to uh, I'm trying to engage a lot more strategically to add impact, to give them direction, and to establish a greater network for them to work with uh, as they pursue their objectives in financial literacy. Your story reminds me of or that point reminds me of an article I just read in the Post this morning, and it was a coverage of the decision by the U.S. Soccer Association, I guess it is, to pay the women's team more equitably, and which was quite a celebration for them just yesterday. But it went on to describe how these cases, these these lawsuits, these complaints, these, you know, agitating for reform uh, have been going on in the private sector as well. And in, <clears throat> in so many cases, there's this kind of pat on the head approach <laughs> by management, as the Soccer Association did for years. And finally, this admission is like, yeah, you were right. And, and the trickle down effect and impact that that decision is going to have on private sector groups and, you know, the, the cashiers in the banks and the, the cashiers at Walmart and the, you know, the stores who, and, and the restaurants, frankly, who have been paying um, not only women, but some of these laborers a very poor wage for many, many years. And if they're going to step into these roles of maybe earning some more money, you need to learn how to manage it early on, early on. So it kind of goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Yes, Julie, and I believe if we associate sports with the development of youth leadership that may from this pool of athletes, maybe our next senator, congressman, treasurer, um, it's an investment, it's a wise investment to have equity, whether it's pay or promotion, so that, and, and they go hand in hand, you promote, you, you, your, your, your wages obviously in many cases um, is increased as a result of greater responsibility. But these sports entities have been recreational but they definitely could be training grounds, not only for leadership, but incorporate the financial. I bet you they have a lot of financial literacy understanding in that women's soccer team now as a result of pushing. I mean, they really learned the value of money uh, very quickly and uh, based on equity. So I think we can apply kind of the kind, same concept to all other venues where women are engaged. So I thought this is my time to role model to mentor uh, the next generation of women leaders. And so um, I think as women, we have a responsibility to really take every opportunity, whether it's a soccer team, going back to your point, or anytime we put our name on some document to really understand and appreciate the responsibility that that signature has on a particular document. Um, and, and so the, the fact that the president, when he swore me in as administrator for SBA, I had family members there in the Hispanic community, leaders, 
rejoicing that moment uh, of promotion. Uh, and, I, and I think those milestones should be amplified so people can understand the importance of them. They're incremental, but they're very important in the journey to equity for all. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And it's such a great reminder that many times great progress comes from incremental steps. And the key is to continue to persevere and to maybe be a little patient, <laughs> but to get comfortable with the role of agitating and pushing and, and making these points. What a, what a, a beautiful picture you've drawn uh, with those stories as we as we wrap up our conversation. We could always talk for a very long time. <laughs> oh, for sure. We haven't gone through all our questions yet, but that's fine. I hope I kind of captured the essence of the others. Well, you have, but but please feel free. What What else had you thought about that you might like to mention that we haven't touched on yet? Well, I, I just wanted to emphasize the, the quality of, of federal employees that we have in the United States. And we sometimes underestimate their impact on policy, legislation, programs, gr who gives the grant, how much should be allocated. And I, besides the civil duty and public service and um, being a trustworthy and honorable citizen, I think we should learn more about our government. So as you embark in your training programs, Julie, for the THA, I believe we should educate people incrementally about the importance of government and all its employees. I, I, I learned so much under the pandemic. You know, three very specific events, national events occurred while I was at Treasury. The Tax Cuts Jobs Act required that I travel throughout the United States, educating people on the impact that those taxes were going, tax cuts were going to make in each family, in each business. Um, a lot of non-for-profits wondered, uh, although they weren't exposed to taxes, would they be at some point and what would that mean for them as well? Um, in addition to the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, the other was what I learned at Treasury, and this is for all the young leaders observing this, what you learn today is very critical on how you'll perform later. Because what I did at Treasury assisted me immensely when I went, as it, when I took the role on as an uh, administrator at SBA. And being there one month, and within the 31st or 32nd day of my, my role as an uh, administrator, we get a pandemic that rolled out globally. And so all the relationships that I had established at Treasury and the guidance from the Secretary I parlayed and it became part of a tapestry to pull off uh, implementing uh, programs like the PPP, IDLE, uh, Disaster Recovery, and all of the other stimulus packages that were associated with SBA and Treasury. So never underestimate what you're doing today because it definitely can positively and extremely impact what you do tomorrow the new roles and responsibility that we